how do we measure achievement gaps and learning trends for young Americans? The answer is a test that you may never have heard of. The National Assessment of Educational Progress, called NAEP, but better known as the nation's report card. NAEP has been around since Lyndon Johnson was in the White House. Today, it tests school children in grades four, eight, and 12 across 10 subjects. It tests a random sample of about 100 schools per state and about 50 students per school, just enough to yield valid data. For reading and math, it delivers results every two years, yielding data for the whole country, for every state, and for more than two dozen cities. These data are how we know that the reading and math prowess of high school seniors has flatlined for decades, even as the graduation rate has risen. They're how we know that 44% of white eighth graders were proficient in math in 2019, while just 14% of black students reached that level, underscoring the persistent achievement gaps that recent education reform efforts have failed to close. And soon, NAEP will yield definitive data on learning setbacks wrought by the COVID-19 pandemic and school shutdowns. Surprisingly, this indispensable test has avoided the political controversies that other tests and federal programs have almost always faced. It's low stakes with no direct consequences for the students, for the teachers, or the schools that participate. The test content avoids controversy through a multi-year process that engages a host of education stakeholders with final decisions made by an autonomous policy setting body called the National Assessment Governing Board, which I had the honor of chairing during its first two years. But can NAEP sustain its reputation as the gold standard of achievement testing? And can it avoid today's political battles and culture wars over what young Americans should be taught? To do so will require some key changes. First, NAEP needs to embrace technology. Today's process is far too cumbersome as federal contractors physically transport tablets to every participating school and engage on-site supervisors to monitor the kids who take the test. That process is expensive, labor-intensive, inefficient, and slow. Instead, the tests could be done with school zone equipment, transmitted electronically and stored in the cloud. That won't be simple, but it's certainly doable. Nor has NAEP developed adaptive tests, which would spare students from wasting time on questions that are far too easy or difficult for them. That would permit both faster testing and more precise identification of their individual strengths and weaknesses. The second major reform is rethinking the test's scope and timing. What subjects should be tested and how often? in what grade levels, and in what jurisdictions. Right now, the schedule keeps jumping around. Going forward, the rule of thumb should be regularity. We could picture NAEP assessments adhering to four-year cycles. We could test reading and math on four-year cycles beginning the first year, then test science the next year, history, civics, and geography the third year, and then finally, art and technology in the last year of the cycle. Finally, we should improve the way NAEP results are reported in order to increase the test's visibility and impact. For instance, we could add a retail element to the assessment, giving parents a way to estimate how their district, their school, or their child is faring against NAEP standards. NAEP should certainly provide states with 12th grade data in the future, as it already does for grades four and eight. Other challenges await, can NAEP stay focused on academic achievement at a time when many educators are preoccupied with outcomes such as equity, diversity, and citizenship rather than literacy and numeracy? I hope so. The goal is not to replace NAEP and certainly not to end it. But getting it in shape for the next 50 years is an undertaking as ambitious and demanding as it is vital.